education and experience into an InfoSec career. Um, we have a slight... Uh, can you not hear me? Mic closer. Mic to mouth. Okay. Apparently, this is a really insensitive mic. All right. So, apparently not quite ready yet. Okay, well. Well, okay. Can you not... Are you not getting audio for this? We have three mics. Adrian, we're using two wired mics, so... I don't know. It's working. I Hopefully it's right. I can hear you. I can hear you as long as you have the yeah, mic Yeah, I can hear me through the... Bring it close. Bring it close. Yes, I have to eat the mic, apparently. <laughs> yep, eat the mic. I know. Oh, come on. Be like Mariah Carey. Adrian. <laughs> hey, there we go. That's a lot louder. I hope that's louder. You good, Adrian? <laughs> Maybe. The, the name in the book is wrong. That would be why. The name in the schedule was wrong. It's right on the website. Mm. It's fine. Okay. All righty then. So we're going to get started and hope it's recording for all those who couldn't be here today because limited tickets. So parlaying education and experience into an InfoSec career. Uh, Anybody trying to get their first job in InfoSec, it's kind of a painful process, um, and a lot of people struggle with it. So we got together at panel and figured we'd talk to you guys about that struggle and maybe some ideas on how to help, how to do it better. Uh, so panelists, obviously introducing ourselves a little bit. Um, I'm Forgotten Sec. Uh, I ended up being the moderator for this panel. I train people on a bunch of stuff, including Snort. Uh, I did get my bachelor's not too long ago, and I ended up starting my own company to do training called Forgotten Security. Yeah, shameless plug. Um, so one of the fun resources that I ended up building before this talk was compiling every talk that I could find on this subject of how to get that first role, how to make the transition that is so painful, ideas, suggestions, resources on getting that first job and going from being a student to working in the InfoSec field. Um, Kat, or Sweet Kat, uh, I guess we'll start with you. I'm Kat, um, the Sweet Cat on Twitter. I've had a lot of people today randomly say, oh, you're the Sweet Cat from Twitter. <laughs> um, I am currently in my final semester of studying network security at Madison Area Technical College, which is the community college in my hometown of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I have a part-time security job working for my school security team, generic blue team stuff. Um, I also am, I run the CFP for Circle City Con and just joined the B-Sides Las Vegas staff as their lockpick village coordinator. Um, so I've been involved with the InfoSec community for a few years. Okay, and Kate? Oh, uh, I'm Kate. I just graduated from Towson in 2015 with my bachelor's, and I now work for Talos doing uh, vulnerability research and detection for them. And now I am here talking to you. All right, and Nisjit. Hey, everybody, I'm Nisjit. Um, Brian and I go back to like 2012, 2011 when I was at Capital College working my master's degree. He helped me uh, with a project for one of my classes that got me graduate, so probably shouldn't say that now, but okay. Uh, I only, I own, I own my Helped. Own. I didn't do the work for no, no. you, right? I Shh. taught you. Shh. It's fine. Yes, yeah. uh, it was an educational experience overall, uh, on top of the master's. But anyway, I, I run my own company, Argotis. Um, we do federal contracting. Uh, right now, we're up north at the agency. I provide, um, I also teach at colleges, um, so we actually now hiring because we just got our clearance. So if anybody's interested in jobs, please send me your resume or check out our website. I had to throw that, that in there. But it'll add on to what we're going to talk about. But anyway, I, I teach colleges. I've been teaching for about eight years. Um, I graduated my master's from Capital Technology University in 2012, UMUC in 2000 on my bachelor's. I, right now I teach at UMUC. I also teach for University of California online, and I've taught at all these colleges around, around Maryland. So happy to be here. All right, so on that note of shameless plugs, uh, 
one of the key things is getting involved in the community. Obviously, you guys have come out here to Besides Nova. Obviously, a good start to meeting a lot of folks and getting involved in the community. Shameless plugs for uh, the hackerspace I run on Allocated Space. My Besides, Besides Baltimore, Besides Charm, and Nova Hackers, which is another local InfoSec group uh, that also go to... Uh, is there such a thing as too many cons? Well, I don't know. I go to a dozen. Um, but that might be too much. Um, depends on who you ask. So getting involved in the community to me is kind of really important because you meet a lot of people. Uh, as you progress through your career, I think it's more important to meet people and get new ideas and new roles. I think as you go through more and more jobs come from the community aspect, I have pretty much always gotten my roles through that avenue. There are others, but I think the community also gives you an opportunity to learn and teach others, building up what the industry has. Um, there's lots of avenues to get involved, whether it's meetups, whether it's going to conferences, um, but meeting others in the community and participating and helping others is huge. Okay. Um, so I'm a student, and there, one thing I've that's really struck me about student um, tech organizations is that it's not just limited to students. There are often employers looking and sort of tapped in with um, with students, at least at my school. Um, so it's not only a good way to sort of learn in a collaborative setting because when you're sort of doing security education, just self-teaching on your own. You don't really have that same level of like feedback from other peers who are still, who are learning at the same time as you are. So you get some of that engagement. And as far as the job search goes, uh, there are tons of um, employers who will like sometimes sponsor security club events for us. They'll be watching at CCDC competitions. Um, CCDC, for those of you who don't know, is the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. It's a, um, a student, student group um, sort of blue teaming exercise. There are professional pen testers who um, basically own the shit out of you while you try to defend a, <laughs> a pretend network with very with with a lot of security vulnerabilities so good real life experience but um it, it, that can be a way to actually you know meet some of the people in the community so yeah even even as a student you're not just you're not just building connections with other students you're potentially meeting future employers I'll, uh, I'll actually kind of piggyback off of what Kat just said. Um, I would not be sitting here, I would not have the job that I have now if I hadn't gotten out and gotten involved. And I think you really need to kind of start that while you're a junior and senior in school. Um, a little bit on my or background. Freshman. Or freshman. Or freshman's even better. <laughs> but um, part of my background is I was just basic computer science major. I thought I wanted to do software development, and then I had an internship in software development and realized that I could not sit at my desk and code for nine hours a day. That was just not what I wanted to do. So I didn't want to go to a different major because I still loved working with computers, and I thought to myself, well, what can I do that's not software development that can help me get somewhere? And so I joined the security club at school. I knew nothing. I didn't know anything about security. I joined the club, and... It was a really great way to kind of show me what I can do and what I can learn. And I did CTF events. I did CCDC here. And I think doing that really pushed me to find my passion, to realize what I wanted to do. And now that I'm out, I think it's even more important for me to go. I go to the Charm Tech meetings. Um, I'm here talking. I think just knowing people, networking with people, it really helps you learn new things. Um, you get to meet people that you would never meet otherwise and kind of learn what they do. And if that interests you, great. And I think it just, it opens avenues that you wouldn't really think that are open for you. So that's, like, I wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't get out, join clubs at school, join meetups here. So it's really helped a lot. Oh, sorry. Talk loud. <laughs> CharmSec is yeah. the Baltimore City sec for anyone who didn't know. So meet up in a bar, talk InfoSec with other professionals. 
There's a lot of city sects around the country, including, I think, two here in Northern Virginia. So, um, so I, I guess from my perspective, what they're saying is definitely the thing to do to find opportunities to business and do network, network with people. I know I started my career in 98, and the only people I knew were my classmates, and it was a lot of, the landscape was a lot different back then, also many 200 years ago. Um, but anyway, uh, so, but over the past several years, especially te teaching at colleges, being a part of uh, competitions, uh, schools are so much more involved with making sure, like, they're so focused in on their cyber, uh, their cyber platform and their education that they have, like, instructors that come in, uh, you have people at adjuncts like myself that own their own businesses that are teaching, get connected with them. I think the most, one of the most important thing is find out what you like doing in cyber, whether you're, it's offensive, defensive, 95% of everybody wants to be a hacker, then 90% of them realize how difficult that is. You end up becoming a, a, the blue team person. Um, but find out what you really enjoy doing. And then when you get these competitions, because it's going to eat out like time of your day. As a, And I'm going to talk from a little bit of a di business side. It's really important to know business savvy, too. As much as it's good to understand all the t technical stuff, if you come to me and you start talking to me about different business aspects of how you can approach and apply things, my, my ears are going to perk up. Landscape, once again, in 2017, um, it's changed a lot, and they're actually expecting you to know, be a little business savvy as well. You know, like, I mean, I know the whole stereotype of Mountain Dew and pizza, and as a hacker, you don't have to be able to talk to anybody, just be in front of the computer. Let me tell you, that, that's, that's not as accurate anymore. You have to be a little bit social. Not Facebook social, I'm talking like be talkative and sell yourself, market yourself. Um, I attend, as a business owner, I attend so many business development meetings that you can't just email people and hope that works out. Come into these kind of competitions, go into the, the meetups. Brian, I've known him for a while, and he's been very, very good about that in the community. His unallocated space, he invited me to one a long time ago. I'm, I have a continuous invitation. I just never really went because I never had time, except for one. But he does a lot for the community. So having people like that that really understand and have the connections, but have a goal in mind of what type of career you want to pursue, what you're interested in, and then focus your attention on that. When you find potential employers or businesses that are there, Find out what opportunities they have. See if they have internships. See if they have, I know Booz Allen Hamilton, um, they, uh, although I've never worked for them, I don't ever. A shameless plug button. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, well, I, I have some choice words, but um, anyway, they know, I know that, they're, uh, that, they're, that they have a competition that they're, they're starting, um, and, and so be, understand what kind of competitions different industries are starting, different businesses are starting, uh, and then see if you can do some intel. If you know that going in and you go talk to a hiring table, XYZ company at a, at a competition, you're like, hey, I know about you guys. You guys have this competition that you're starting. They're going to be like, what, you know about this? And, you know, what, what, you know. So, uh, anyway, um, and that'll help you guys a long way. Common thread. Competitions are not just about getting a job. Competitions also are great learning and training opportunity. And we all played them. I think I dragged Nischit to actually be the teacher for a few so I could try to drag more students into playing. <laughs> the other thing about community involvement is you don't just show up as an attendee. What really sets you apart is giving back. Volunteer, be a presenter, be be a staff somewhere. That that really sets you apart. Shows that you can, like you said, dispel the stereotype of not working well with humans. So <laughs> it's good to show you, you you can actually care enough to want to support the community and make it better and not just be a passive benefactor of it. Also, talking to random people, I have actually have tweeted out, who wants to get lunch at DEF CON? Very interesting responses from random people who search at DEF CON like, sure, I'll go to lunch with you. Who are you? It makes for a very fun conversation. Um, or pretty much any con where you don't know a lot of people, trying to get out there, volunteering, Great opportunity to meet people, um, building up your network and people who are an expert in what you're not. You can't be an expert in everything. So having that network of people to say, hey, Bob knows about reverse engineering. Let me go contact him. I have a specific question. Uh, so leading to that, the other side of the community, the online community. Uh, this was actually a joke I did uh, right around the hacking team breach where they got uh, all of their lovely exploits pulled and I made possibly the most ridiculous URL I could totes.legit.not 
malware.su slash evil.txt.s shockwave flash, because everybody loves flash, right? 47 people click this link. Um, Twitter, yeah. Uh, I know a lot of them were malware analysts looking to see what I had shared. I totally did not buy that domain. It was awesome, but yeah, they wouldn't let me buy it. Um, so Twitter is probably one of the strongest community aspects to InfoSec because of the ability to share resources in an instant. There are so many blogs that have that one post that I needed that I never would have found if somebody didn't tweet it out and somebody I knew retweeted. And at the same time, as I said, conferences, tweeting out a lot of conference interactions and meetings, trying to find even the people from my own panel, uh, Twitter was involved. So um, Twitter is probably the strongest online community, but also and GitHub Facebook Projects. Messenger. Hmm? Contacted me from Facebook Messenger. Uh, yeah, some people don't necessarily have Twitters that they use. Hey, you get what you get. But, um, you know, GitHub community projects, being able to contribute to community projects like the one I mentioned earlier, um, with all the lovely resources for transitioning in InfoSec. So, um, I personally went nuts and really got involved in the online community and spent a lot of time tweeting and sharing content and have met a bunch of people at conferences who are like, oh, you're that person I met on Twitter. Or you tweeted this and it was really interesting. Uh, really funny because you don't always have a picture and you don't recognize who it is. Really awkward for a minute sometimes, but lots of fun. Um, Meeting people online for the first time, like, oh, I talked to you for Twitter for two years. I've now met you because I'm at DEF CON or I'm at this conference and you're there. Um, a lot of events, meetups at conferences that are targeted for specific groups. So CCDC players at some conferences will have meetups. Um, yeah. So online communities. Well, I'm on Twitter a lot. Um Apologies for the cat photos. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. Never apologize for cat photos. At least Slightly less than me. DA's aliens. <laughs> Seems fine. No, I do try to follow a lot of InfoSec people on Twitter, and I've um, been introduced to a lot of people that way, um, even before I had gone back to school for it and when I was first getting involved in cons. Um, it was just interesting to hear what various people were saying about the same event, like a major breach or something. And I think that's also... A strong case for following some non infosec people on Twitter too. Like it's when something major is happening in, in, in the infosec world or something infosec related, it's interesting to see reactions to it, not just from infosec, but other perspectives as well, because it's important to not get too echo chambery. Yeah, I think it's uh I think it's a really quick way to share information out that is sometimes useful and maybe sometimes not so useful. But um, it's it's definitely a really great way. I I tend to use it more to just keep in contact with people that I've met at different conferences that might not be local here, so I can't just go and see them all the time. And it's, it's just it's a really great way just to kind of widen the area of communication, I guess, for lack of better Personal words. network, maybe? Personal, yeah, there you, there you go. Yeah, Yes, tw Twitter explodes on certain things, but um, yeah, so it's it's really useful most of the time. Um, I tweet a lot of coffee pictures. Uh, Starbucks has yet to endorse me, but we're we're, we're hoping. But no, um, it's it's a good way to reach out to people that you otherwise, you know, emails get lost. I hardly check my email. Brian, I'm sure knows that by now. It's much easier to reach me on Twitter than it is on my email. So I think it's. It's definitely a faster way to communicate and to really just keep in touch with people that you wouldn't otherwise meet or really otherwise have means to communicate with. So, it's pretty much. I mean, I, for me, I usually like if I post jobs and all that. I use, I use uh, Facebook. I like use LinkedIn, which uh, I, I. The only reason I have LinkedIn is because it's good to have presence. It's the, probably one of the most useless social media tools ever. Um, anyway. Uh, 
And then on Twitter, I only post job openings. I know as an employer side, I just post like a lot of cyber articles. I find it Twitter really useful to to uh, post because you have a Twitter. Yeah, at Argotis, <laughs> my company name. It was at Nishid Radio when I a few years ago, but I forgot the password because it was connected to my first employer, and I don't have access to their email anymore. It's been like a decade. But anyway, uh, so uh, but I don't usually. Uh, the only thing I do on our with that is just post like where the presence of what we're up to. Um, and it's a good way to follow like all the latest things are going on and get your knowledge. I follow pretty much all like cyber companies and get the information on the latest tax and all that. Once again, just connecting that way. And, and as Brian and 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 the cat and gate have said, <laughs> uh, the two Ks actually said that um, just use it. I'm See, I'm sorry. I'm My apologies. I'm so used to the K anyway. Um, the the CK and they were saying um, that it's just good to find out who's going to be there at different. Uh, no, events and all that. And I still use the uh, infamous email. <laughs> and I think it's actually... Oh, sorry. Am I to, I think it's actually a really good way for students to be able to kind of reach out and not feel maybe awkward about it. Like, I've had students um, see something that I retweeted and they'll contact me and say, hey, I see you went to Towson. I saw you retweeted this. I see you work now. Like, how did you get where you are? You know, can you explain what you tweeted, what that means? I don't know. And I think it's kind of, at least for me, it's kind of scary to go up to someone in person and be that vulnerable and say, I don't know what this means. Can you explain it? I think it's a lot easier online to just say, hey, you know, I, I think what you said is interesting. Can you elaborate? Can you give me any sort of resources that I can go look up so that I can understand this? And I think, I mean, I think... People have contacted me that way, and I think that's really great. And then if you do meet them in person, you've broken the ice already. Right. There's also the aspect where there's people who maybe are quiet, and they get introduced to Twitter, and somehow they end up tweeting aliens and end up with, like, 10,000 followers. That Can't totally happened. Um, from someone who's really quiet in person, it's kind of amusing and very, very, very prolific on Twitter, both about aliens and about infosec. Um, I think he's writing a book and literally tweeting the various edits. It's kind of funny. Um, so a lot of people who have worked in infosec for a long time and transitioned from the IT world will tell people, you need IT experience first. Um, I myself worked effectively help desk slash anything else they needed kind of stuff for a small consultancy for about 10 years before I actually did anything in InfoSec. Um, a lot of people will tell, will say one of the main avenues for jumping into pen testing is being a sysadmin for years. And really a lot of that is seeing, well, what were you too lazy to do correctly or didn't know to do correctly? And correctly being very interesting because different people disagree on what correct is for how to do any one thing. But it, I, I truly believe that, you know, as more challenges come out, that creates that practical experience that can kind of supplant a lot of that IT experience. CCDC, the fire sale of the network effectively with uh, experienced pen testers attacking a team of students trying to defend a network. Literally, you walk in and inherit a super vulnerable network, and you have to defend it over the course of a weekend as you try to complete IT tasks that you don't necessarily know how to do. That kind of mimics real life. There, there's obviously some suspension disbelief with, hey, there's a dozen hackers who are literally targeting you and constantly and aggressively targeting you individually. Um, that's not quite so realistic for a small organization, um, but the idea that someone could be targeting you, extremely realistic. Granted, the likelihood of you being on keyboard and talking with them in Notepad, probably not so much. That totally happens in CCDC every year. Um, so... The experience of understanding IT, understanding how to set up a network, how to configure Exchange, eh, maybe not, but um, you know, a lot of these experiences make you a better InfoSec professional because you understand what IT infrastructure is like. And I think there's a lot of importance to that. 
Does it have to be a job? Well, that's a really quick way effect to effectively learn it, but it's not necessary. Um, there's other ways to supplant that, in my opinion, but that challenge aspect, as hundreds of challenges exist per year today of all types from policy challenges, which I didn't believe it, but it does actually exist. There was a policy CTF um, to more of the infrastructure, attack, defense, reverse engineering, live, not live. All these different types of challenges kind of simulate a lot of that IT experience. So I, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, I didn't have a tech background. I, InfoSec isn't my first career, and I, um, my undergrad degree is in gender and women's studies, and then I worked in politics for a few years um, before leaving that. Um, and I was doing some self-teaching tech stuff on the side before I decided to go back to school um, to devote more time to the career change. But I hadn't ever had an IT job of any kind. And while I do agree that the InfoSec is such a vast field that it, it, it's good to have some foundational knowledge in a lot of things, which is one of the things that I'm grateful for, for the degree that I'm getting, um, that we get that background in some basic networking stuff, some basic system administration, and some basic programming. Not programming in basic. <laughs> Um, but there, InfoSec also spans beyond just the computers and the network, and there's ever, uh, this is starting to become more of a thing with more people talking about the human side. Um, it's more so than just social engineering. You have to know how to communicate to users, to vendors, to management. You have to know how to make a business case. You have to write, and a lot of those type of skills are very transferable from other fields. Um, I and I did talk about this a couple of years ago called Hacking Our Way Into Hacking. I well, where I thought I was sort of the the lone person who hadn't started an infosec as a child and hadn't been like programming since I was six and breaking their parents' computers because we didn't have a computer. Um, and that the more I got into InfoSec, I started to find that there were a lot of people who were transitioning from completely different fields and making connections with their previous knowledge in really unique ways. Like InfoSec Sherpa spoke earlier today. She used to be a law librarian, and now she's started her own intelligence consulting firm. So um, IT foundational knowledge aside, there's a lot of skills that can transfer from completely different professions. I feel like there's a lawyer joke in there. But, uh, so I obviously also did not really start out with any background experience in uh, security. Like I said, I was a just basic. Closer to your mouth. Closer. I was just basic um, computer science student at Towson, and I had done software development internships. The two internships that I had, and I hated it, and I couldn't do it. So I, anything that I learned about security while at school before this job that I had now, I learned on my own, or I learned through joining the team at Towson. So. Um, I always think it's interesting to ask people, well, how did you get into security or where you are now? Because they all have different answers. And I think it's really hard to answer the question, well, how do I get into InfoSec? Because the honest answer is that there, there is no cookie cutter. There's no like easy button cookie cutter answer to this. It's just however that you found your way into it, whether it's through previous experience with IT companies or whether you were a, you know a women's studies major and didn't like what you were doing and just needed to do something else. I don't think I'm sure the IT experience helps. Um, probably would have been a lot more helpful for me, but I don't think it's required. It's, if you have the passion, you can learn whatever you want to learn, and you just have the passion. You just have to have that passion to go out and learn it. So, um, very accurate points there. Uh, since my career spans about. 200 years ago from 1998. I don't want to bore you with the details of all the twists and turns and bobbing and weaving to where I got into. Uh, what I recommend to my students and to people that are starting out, it's a little bit easier today, but um, for example, the positions that we're hiring for right now, there's plenty of them, but one of them is a ser service desk specialist. Now, with that in mind, you have to have, uh, if, you don't have if you don't have a degree, you still have to have four, years ex four to six years of experience depending on what tier levels it is. So how do you get that experience? Well, 
um, I think today it's a little bit easier than it was was back then for me, is that you become a part of some of these events, right? Uh, if you can, get an opportunity to present something. You never know who's listening. If there's a, an employer there that could be interested, be listening just to, if they happen to be there, they realize you seem to know what you're talking about, hopefully, at least you can BS them, um, and then maybe get an interview out of it if you can at, after it potentially, or just a connection that way. So I think that, that really, uh, that, that can go a long way. Get involved in competitions like cyber defense competitions and, and, just start really understanding what you want to do. And I know I emphasize that a lot. But starting off, and take any position you, you can. Don't be picky, especially when you're starting out. There are people that have been in, in their career 15 years that still get really picky and find themselves unemployed. So don't be those people starting out from the gate. And don't ever be those people. But, but um, just take what you can get. Get whatever experience you can. Get what The biggest thing that they want in IT now is these certifications, no matter if it's commercial or government. So go get the basic certifications that they require. Don't argue. Don't complain. I'm just, oh, yeah, we forgot about that. I'm jumping, jumping the gun here. Uh, but anyway, so that's, that's what they said, and just be involved and, and just get your, understand what you're going to, the job you're going to go for, right? So passion and practical experience sounds like the recipe that I think is the most unifying. Uh, so not necessary, but definitely helpful. Uh, having that IT experience. So, speaking of internships, uh, so, funny story, uh, as a community college student, uh, we had a group of the folks in the security lab who were invited to a community barbecue at a uh, local security vendor, Sourcefire. And I'm like, free food at a cool InfoSec company? Yeah, I'll, I'm showing up to that. So, seven of us actually went out and this nice lady from HR came over and is like, hey, anybody looking for an internship? I'm like, yes. What do I need to do? I hit her resume and I figure, well, what are you guys doing? You came over here just for the free food? Like, don't you want a job? All right, All right. I I'm fine with this. No competition seems good. So then it turned out to be a three and a half hour interview um, of technical questions. That that was an interesting experience. Um, but I ended up interning with them, and it was very, very helpful because they threw lots of things I totally didn't expect. And we're like, oh, yeah, um, starting. You don't know Linux? Yeah. Go learn Linux. Here's VTC. Here's an Ubuntu CD and a desktop. You can't have Windows on there. Go. Uh, that was a uh, fun time. I think his exact words were, go learn to be a sysadmin in a month of Linux without any experience, I think, except for installing like Red Hat 7 and Caldora way back. Um, not RHEL 7, but Red Hat 7, like the old school. Um, so internships, I think, are a huge opportunity to get that experience and to show off, hey, I'm interested in this. Um, lots of that first job getting an internship can turn into, do you want to stay on full-time? Um, I've had a couple of the interns that have worked with the various teams I've been on who have stayed on as full-time employees or, as crazy as it is, part-time employees, which normally doesn't happen, but every once in a while there's a unique snowflake where they allow a part-time employee who's also going to school. Um, those are a little bit harder to find, but as an intern, definitely possible during the school year. Um, a lot of challenges. Actually, CCDC led it to a lot of internships for a lot of people because a lot of what those companies who are sponsoring are looking for is interns to basically test drive to an extent. A lot of the internships are like, hey, we can hire you cheap and see if you're good and kind of let you learn while you're testing and see how good is your work ethic? How fast do you learn? Are you picking up stuff you didn't know? You will probably never walk into a job and know everything that you need to about how that company does things. So the aspect of a test drive, which is kind of what an internship is, I think is optimal for everybody. And being able to put work experience in your resume so that you have that first experience is huge. The first job is always the most painful, especially when transitioning from academia and InfoSec because... You don't have that IT background, you, you're an unknown. So having that first internship is huge. Um, 
Hmm? Yeah. Um, so you had mentioned um, apply for whatever you can when you're first starting out, and um, sometimes you can get surprised. Um, and if your security passion shows through, then sometimes they. Uh, um, for the first InfoSec internship that I ever had, I had applied to a different internship with a local telecom company, and it was on their deployment team or something, and they called me back and said, hey, we decided to hire someone else, but you keep talking about security, so we forwarded your resume to the security team. So if you keep showing up, eventually someone will realize that you're interested in security and maybe pass your resume along. Um, and it... Yeah, they're a great experience. More than just a, taking a company taking you for a test drive and you taking the company for a test drive, um, you get to do certain things in an internship that you don't necessarily get to do as much in a full time day to day operational job. Um, it's it's meant to be devoted to learning. You get to ask a lot of questions. You can do job shadowing. Um, when I was interning in the SOC at TDS, I got to shadow all the other security teams. Um, even though I wasn't doing like access management or engineering, I got to see a little bit of what they did. And it's just meant to be a time for learning and asking questions and making mistakes. And you're not expected to really know things. They want to see someone who actually cares and is interested. And that's what matters to them because you're, you're going to be kind of a drain on their resources and they know that and they took you on anyway. So use that time to, to learn and ask questions and maybe even contribute something. Yeah. So I think internships can be really eye opening, especially for college students. Maybe if you, you know, you think you're, this is what I want to do. This is where I'm going. And then you get to the internship and you're like, Oh my God. I can't write C for nine hours a day. That's just not going to work. So I think that, and when I talk about my internships, people are usually like, oh, well, you know, it's really, that really sucks that you didn't like your internship. And I'm actually really, really, really thankful for those internships because it gave me an opportunity to work. It was something to put on my resume. But I think most importantly, it showed me what I didn't want to do before I got out of college and got to that point. And then was actually hired for a job. And, you know, you don't want your first job. You'd be sitting there going, oh, my God, I screwed up. I went to college for this, and this isn't what I want to do. So I think internships can be really, really, really positive in that you get there and you love the job and you stay on afterwards. Or it can be not so positive, but that's still good, too. It shows you what you don't want to do, which is sometimes kind of more important than you thinking, well, this is exactly what I want to do, and everything's perfect. And then you get out there in the real world, and you're like, no, programming in C for nine hours is just, I can't do it. I, I, the, the classic example of the person who gets into computer science because they want to make video games comes to mind. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know. That, that just, it rings in my head. Because you hear that so often in comp sci programs. Oh, I want to make video games. I take in comp sci. And then they discover what computer science is. And it, they, they change majors sometimes. Sometimes they don't. But There was a talk at B-Sides Las, couple- Las Vegas a couple years ago um, in the Proven Ground called So You Want to Be a Pen Tester. That was a like reality check on, no, this is what a pen tester lifestyle actually is. It's not... It's not an episode of CSI Cyber. <laughs> We're a tiger think, team. I think a lot of people, too, like you have, you have this idea in your mind of what your job is going to be like when you get out, but until you have that reality check of what it actually is, you don't really understand what you're getting into. So I think, I think more colleges should force you to do an internship because it really, it's really eye-opening and can really change your mind about what you're doing and hopefully before it's too late for you to realize that I can't do this and I need to change. And why not? Normally it's money and while money. you're in oh, college because yeah, you that's, you know. Miss? Um, so I, I never actually interned, uh, so I don't can't speak from that experience. So what they said is 100% correct because that's what I see them in colleges, being teaching at colleges. Uh, some things I've thought about that you can do if um, if you don't, if there's not an inter- internship opportunity through your college or whatnot, 
some of the companies that you could talk to if you know anybody that owns their own small businesses or it doesn't even matter if it's a little pizza joint down the street. Um, they have a website. Well, ask if you can develop their website. Do it for free. Um, they might not have money. Or you can say, you know what, I'll do some social media stuff for you guys. And in that social media stuff, talk about the different, understand networks, understand how, how that works, even physical security. And something I've thought about doing for Argotus, which we're going to do to offer internships to my students, um, one of the reasons I started the company, is uh, have them post on social media blogs, white papers, research on different types of attacks, latest attacks. That way you're getting your skill sets up in internships, your understanding uh, info infosec, your specific thing that you want to get a career in, and say, when you go up to an employer saying, look, I've been doing, I've been doing this stuff for a company uh, professionally, or internships are usually paid, hopefully you can get paid ones, um, so that looks a little bit better. But something like that. So you can take the initiative yourself and actually create your own internship with just small businesses that you know. Because we, I'm sure they have a lot of them need, uh, need people that can help them with websites or whatnot. So just keep an eye out for that. Also, pretty much every huge tech company will have internships. Uh, I, at DEF CON, for example, Facebook had their internship meet up and were trying to get people for that. Uh, I ended up talking to someone there, and they were completely looking for software developers, not any security people whatsoever. Well, after talking to someone there, uh, she ended up setting up the Facebook InfoSec internship role that became existing because I went and had the conversation with her and said, you know, I, I'm into the SOC world. I'm not trying to, I, I'm not a developer. That's not what I love, but I like the sock world analysis. Is there an internship in that? No. Why, why not? Right? Like you have a huge team that's monitoring all the social media threats on Facebook, uh, like DA. Right? No. Um. Wait, that was Twitter. Sorry. Eset. Anyway. Um. Eset qualified my good friend DA as a social media threat because he posts malware as a malware analyst. Kind of funny. Um. But Facebook had ended up setting up that internship program that now is running. So it's kind of interesting. So you might be able to talk larger organizations into making more internships in security. Uh, a lot of local organizations, the bigger they are, for example, I know uh, Exelon has a huge internship program in here that has hundreds in the Maryland, D.C., Virginia, Chicago, Philly areas. They have, hun I think, a couple hundred interns. Um, so... Tons of people I know have gotten roles through that. Um, T. Rowe Price has some. I mean, there's a bunch of different companies that have internship programs for security in the area. And who knows, you might even be able to get a clearance if it's somebody who works in that world. So, this is all about academia, but formal education. Um, yeah, curiosity. Uh, yeah. So... One of the fun discussions is um, what level of degree do you need? And I've seen people go from high school, play the challenges and get involved in the community. Uh, actually, a high school I know went and got offensive uh, OSCP, Offensive Security Certified Professional, probably one of the hardest InfoSec certs for pen testing straight out of high school. So... Um, Definitely possible to make that transition. Definitely harder. Uh, I got a bachelor's degree, which a lot of organizations require. Um, I think as we progress through InfoSec, that's changing for some more modern organizations where there's not as much focus on that. Um, I think a lot of management starts to get in the master's world. I think as you get towards that, you start to get less technical. Um, some programs disagree, but most of the master's programs I've found in InfoSec are either repeats of the undergrad at a more accelerated pace and more demanding pace, or more management side of things, policy, orchestration, budget. Um, and then uh, there was a doctoral student in my college who actually did his thesis on proving that a honeypot meant to simulate services is more efficient than um, more efficient than actually having the virtual machines set up. And I said, "Well, that that's seems kind of obvious, but wait, that that was your doctoral thesis." 
cool research. Like, I'm glad you proved it, but you said, you know, I move the industry forward. I prove something. Now everything I write has doctor on it. I, I don't know. Um, there's a lot of great doctoral theses that are being worked on, but I don't know. I see the best bang for your buck at the, at the undergrad level. Um, some disagree. I don't know. Well, it's all about what you're hoping to get out of it. I mean, if you're getting a PhD, you're probably going into academia. Um, you're probably not going to work in industry. If, you, if you're at a master's degree, you could be going on to a PhD, um, or you could be maybe going into management. Um, but the thing about formal education, and a lot of people like to sort of malign it or say that it's completely worthless because it doesn't always lead directly to a job or give you job training skills, but that's not necessarily what it's for. I I think technical colleges focus more on skills and um, specific tools sometimes, um, less on critical thinking and problem solving. Um, I definitely got a lot more of that out of my um, undergrad degree. It wasn't in a tech field. Like I said, it was gender and women's studies, but um, regardless of the major, um, there weren't a lot that had a direct line to one specific job, even in the sciences like math, bio, chem. Um, there were a lot of possibilities, but you still learn, it's like they say, you, you, you learn how to think and you don't necessarily learn all the information, but you start to learn how to look up information, how to ask good questions, how to parse what's worth what's worthy information versus what the what's complete bullshit um and so there's different values and so i feel like when people stop trying to expect certain degrees to be things that they're not meant to be then you can start to see the the different values of each of each stage of of school and if you if you expect the same thing out of each out of each one you you going to be frustrated. Why isn't this PhD lending me an entry-level analyst job? <laughs> um, so, yeah, but I got two completely different things out of my two different degrees, and I, I think both are very necessary. Um, educational costs are high, and so for a lot of jobs in InfoSec, I don't feel like they sh degrees should be compulsory. Sorry, am I going over my time? Okay. I'll stop talking. Okay. Um, I'll make this quick. Uh, I don't think I am, at least in my experience, when I was applying for a lot of jobs at different companies, uh, higher education was not a requirement. They would just rather you know what you say you know. And I think um, if you are going to do college or um, education, then it's kind of what you make it. You can either be the student that just shows up to class and just does the test and you're done. You graduated. You have the degree. Or you can be the student that goes to class, but that extra go, that also goes the extra mile to join the clubs and to do different school activities and to reach out to different people and learn different things. And I think the, those two students are going to have completely different careers. Um, one is going to be the one that just skirts by on doing what they have to do, and the other one's going to be a lot more successful probably and to have the opportunity to learn different things. So I'm, I'm a little biased on this subject because I teach colleges. I have my master's and, and the, uh, the old, the old argument in IT always was we don't need a degree to move, to have a job or move forward. Well, I kind of, about a little over a decade ago, my oldest cousin, he has like two masters from Hopkins and he and I used to get into arguments. He's like, you need to get your undergrad. I was like, I don't. I make 45 a year at SAIC. I'm good. He's like, get your, get your degree and you'll be, and you'll, you'll see your career go improve. And so I wanted to get into InfoSec in 2006, 2007, 2005, 2006. I looked at jobs for InfoSec and they required at the time, they still do, because I know I'm now hiring for these, uh, they required a bachelor's degree to get into it. I'm like, wow, okay. So I got my, master, my bachelor's and then I was like, why not? Let's get the master's and get it done. The biggest thing is, guys, especially because a lot of these companies, if you get an internship, they're going to pay for your education anyway. It's a check, it's a checkbox. So they can't tell you, once you have it, 
they can't tell you that you need it or you don't have it and you can't get an opportunity because of it. It's just something there that will open your door. So don't get caught up in the I don't need it because you know what? The people that have it are going to sidestep you and actually start getting into better positions potentially. And when cuts start happening, they got to start slicing somewhere. So the people that don't have degrees are probably going to be the first out the door when budget cuts happen. So don't even argue. Just go, go to college, get your degrees, get your master's at the very least. PhD, she's right. Um, I, I considered getting my PhD, and then I said, nope, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to be stuck in academia, and, and then I teach. But I don't want to be a research person. So that's my point. But once again, this is from a biased person who's been teaching colleges for eight years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tons of time to play challenges while you're in college, if you take the opportunity. We're having questions at the end, because we're running short on time. Yes, I know that. Um, it also depends on what content, because there are specific programs that are focused in, like, reverse engineering or um, forensics. There's not really one in SOC operations yet or anything uh, along that, but reverse engineering and forensics are specific programs focused on those. So now we come back to certs. Um, so we talked a little bit about certs. Uh, Certs are similar to a degree, an opportunity for HR to get in the way or weed out candidates uh, quickly. Um, they prove that you can have a base level of knowledge. Um, it's one avenue to get through a pipeline to getting that experience. Um, it's not the only one. Uh, I know a lot of people that have gone without certs and have been very, very successful. I know tons of people who have gone after certs if your company pays for them, but, but there, there's a point where why not? Um, regardless of what it is, how proud are you if they're willing to pay and it's valuable? Um, um. It, in the government side, it is very critical. I cannot argue because they made a regulation requiring it, but there's ways around it, and those companies will actually pay for your cert if they like you enough. They will pay for you to get your cert, and you can spend the first six months without that cert while you're getting it. So there are avenues around it, but is it required to get the job? Generally not. Yeah, get your uh, certs and your degrees. Just get all the check marks, check boxes, and you're good. And then the experience will come, but I, I don't know what more, more to say. I have people that argue, and I'm like, just go get it. If you have it, they can't argue against it. So you can't say, the only thing that you don't get a job, the only reason you, you don't get a job is A, you don't know what you're, you don't know what you're talking about, you're doing, and B, you just don't know how to interview. So those are the only two other things. But get, get them. Don't argue. Just go get your degree, get your certs. Um... Yep. Um, I'm not in D.C., and certs, I think, are a much bigger thing around here than in some other places. Um, from my standpoint, I'm a student. I don't have a lot of money. Somebody else is going to pay for my certs? Sure, I'll take tests. Um, if I've got a few hundred dollars to spare, I'm going to go to a con, not get a cert. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with that. Um, I don't have any certs. I got hired just fine without a cert. Um, thankfully, I work for a company that really just bases their hiring off of what you know or what you don't know, not what a piece of paper says about you. But um, if you're lucky enough to work for a company that will pay for certs, then sure, go get them. But if the company doesn't require them, unless there's one specific company you really want the job for and they require a cert, don't do it. Great way to get through HR. Uh, but yeah. totally internships, if you can get them to pay for a cert, that's always an option sometimes. So, we just mentioned interviews. Uh, interviews in this industry are kind of interesting, uh, as well as job descriptions and titles, because cyber engineer and security analyst, uh, I think I just described like 70% of Maryland, D.C., Virginia jobs, titles. Um, so, interviewing becomes kind of interesting, because we tend to ask a lot of questions that aren't really related to the work that you're actually going to be doing. Um, it's kind of like a nerd check in a lot of cases, unfortunately. Um, what I tend to recommend to people is show your passion for the industry. Don't BS people. They will call you out on it. And I know if you show you have a genuine interest, the ability to learn and get involved in the community, 
that's gener and an aptitude for the actual work that you're trying to do. That is generally a lot of what it takes. Also, being able to explain things like what the business case is for something, right? Why you pen test because it's cool. Well, no, that doesn't work, right? Explaining that there's actually business risk and going down that road and similar business cases for other roles become very important, make you much more valuable. Um, yeah, since we're short on time, um, there was a good talk at DerbyCon about interviewing. Go watch it. Um, I didn't I didn't do it, but um, yeah, and also get used to rejection. It's a part of life. And I don't just say that because I'm CFP co-chair. Um. Uh, at the company I currently work for, I was told that the best answer I ever gave to an interview question was, I haven't had the opportunity to learn that, but I would really like to know more about it. And so I would just, I think the main point is that saying I don't know is an okay answer. They would rather you be honest and say, you know what, I haven't had the opportunity to learn that, rather than try to sit there and BS them, that they would much rather you just be honest and say, look, I don't know, but I would really like the opportunity to learn that. Um, briefly, just to add to that, uh, yeah, it's good to understand what you're going going for the for the interview. Understand the layout. Uh, be personable. Don't be a robot when you're sitting there. Don't be all nervous wreck. It's just an interview. Um, be okay with saying I don't know, and and just put them at ease. You know, your interview. It's you're not going there just to get a job with them. They're hiring you and making sure that you're your best self, and they're going to always get that from you. Also, a lot of hiring areas will have mock interviews. Make use of them. Colleges do that as well. Although I think conferences that do it kind of have a different aspect from the technical perspective. So getting that first job, uh, very painful for a lot of folks. Um, there's a lot of unreasonable job requirements, right? Ten years of Windows 10 experience. Um, totally seen that too many times and too much frustration CSSP for a junior level role. There's, uh, unfortunately, you have to kind of talk to the folks and see what they actually want because, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, the job descriptions aren't very clear. Um, that's why I always try to talk to people at conferences and use that to leverage getting a job. If I want a job, I'm going to research who's in that company and talk to their professional folks and, who are more technical and say, what are you actually doing, right? What are the tools I'm using that I need to understand? What type of work is this? Because even saying Security Operations Center, a lot of the job descriptions don't even explain that that's what a role is, even if it is. Uh, that could be really, really frustrating. We've got almost no time left, so should we do questions? Yeah. Um, we got like one minute. Question. We got like one minute. <laughs> yep. So, how many people attribute to college to death by PowerPoint? I commonly attribute CISP to death by PowerPoint. So, I got one Yes. Um, so, people want to use like Security Plus or CPH or CISP as like a stepping stone into the industry. But doesn't want to reminisce about the death by PowerPoint age in college. I mean, you can't just go straight to the OSCP, which is all. That, that's why I find value in college classes with labs. That we actually need to have Some colleges don't really do many labs, so that's a reality. Um, better programs will. Getting that practical experience is critical. Whether labs provide you that opportunity or whether they do it on your own, whether it's through challenges, practical experience, it, being able to do what you know the theory of is incredibly critical. Uh, Yep. But there are, you also have to understand that no matter how much learning you do on your own, there are going to be things that you won't really understand until you've worked in in a security job in that environment. Like one of the things I was talking about was just the fact with friends that was just the fact that every environment is different and it's structured differently. Um, and also there's a baseline. When you're doing labs, you're only looking for anomalies. You've got to figure out what normal is. Oh, sorry. Talking again. On a panel. <laughs> All right. How dare you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> we'll be around for more discussion after. Thank you.
Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>